Homage to the fundamental teacher Buddha Shakyamuni. Homage to the wisdom warrior Manju Shri. Homage to all the benevolent lineage masters. With all of your kindness and love, let you wisdom's shiny light clear the darkness of my ignorance once and for all. Grant me, I pray, the intelligence, the brilliance to understand the scriptures, both the word and the treatises. Until awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. To accomplish the welfare of self and others, I give rise to bodhicitta. We're going to study eight verses for training the mind. Uh, this is by Gashi Nangritamba and commented by Kampo Sudaji. And we are all familiar with the text, I hope, already. Um, it's a short text, but it's very profound. Um, so the entire text and plus the commentary is only like 20 plus pages. Um, for Kambu's commentary, uh, he first gave the background of the text and uh, gave some uh, instructions and then told us about the author, uh, Nori Tampa, and then the title of the text. And then we go verse by verse, and there are only eight verses, eight verses of training the mind. Um, but here, um, there is a very nice uh, outline, actually uh, give a little subtitle to each verse. Uh, like verse one is always hold others as dear as dear and precious and so on and so forth. Uh, this will be very helpful um, as you can see uh, when we study the text. So we will keep our um, like a uh, old way of like a uh, study. So we'll just go person by person to read out the text and then we can do a little discussion and uh, if necessary, I can give some uh, explanation on certain things, not quite a lot. Kampu uh, give did not give very extensive teaching on this one here. So we'll probably just adhere to what Kampu taught. Um, so let's go. The first one who wants to start. Okay. Uh, background of the text. <laughs> Excuse me. This short text was paid high attention by many great masters throughout the history. His Holiness Jigme Ponsak Rinpoche regarded this text as a principal instruction among all the Dharma teachings he imparted. In his life, he had taught this text dozens of times. Once His Holiness told his students, to be a genuine Dharma practitioner, one must grasp the meaning of three commentaries, which are the 37 practices of a Bodhisattva by Thagme Zangpo, the three principal aspects of the path by Lama Tsongkhapa, and the eight verses for training the mind by Geshe Longri Tangpa. He required the Sangha at Larangar to recite these three commentaries. Patro Rinpoche had a story about this text in his famous book, The Words of My Perfect Teacher. Once Geshe Chikawa, who knew many teachings of both the new and the old traditions and who knew many texts by heart, went to see Geshe Chakshinwa. On his pillow, he saw a small text and when he opened it, he came across the sentence. I will take defeat upon myself and give the victory to others. What a wonderful teaching, Chikawa thought, and he asked Chakshinwa what the teaching was called. It's the eight verses of Langri Thangpa said Chakshingwa. Who holds these instructions? Geshe Langri Thangpa himself. Chikawa was determined to receive these teachings. First, he went to Lhasa and spent some days circumambulating the sacred places. One evening, a leper from Langtang 
told him that Lungri Thangpa had passed away. Chikawa asked who was the successor of the successor of the lineage and was told that there were two potential successors, Shangshungpa and Dodepa, but they could not agree on the succession matter. However, they were not arguing out of competitiveness. Shangshupa would tell Dodepa, you are the older, you take the succession. I will serve you as though you were Langri Thangpa himself, but Bodepa would answer, you are the more learned, you shall be the successor. Although their disagreement about the succession was out of their pure perception of each other, Chikawa interpreted as a shortcoming and considered neither of them to be the holder and Langri Thangpa's teaching, of Langri Thangpa's teaching. He tried to find out who was its best holder and everybody told him that it was Sharawa. Sh Sharawa was giving a teaching of many volumes to thousands of the Sangha members. Chikawa had listened to him for a few days, but did not hear him say a word about the teaching he sought. He seems not to have it either, he thought, but I'll ask him. If he has this teaching, I'll stay. Otherwise, I'd better move on. So Chikawa went to see Sharawa, who was circumambulating a stupa. He spread out a cloth on the ground and invited Sharawa to sit down for a moment, saying, I have something to ask you. Venerable monk, said Sharawa, what is your problem? Personally, I've always found all my answers on my meditation cushion. I read these words and I read these words in a text. I will take defeat upon myself and give the victory to others. I like them very much. Is this a profound teaching or not? Venerable monk, Sharawa replied, whether or not you like this teaching, it is the one you can only dispense with you if you don't want to attain Buddhahood. Do you hold this teaching? Yes, it's my main practice, Sharawa replied. Then I beg you, teach it to me, said Chikawa. Can you stay with me for a long time, Sharawa asked. If you can, I will teach it to you. From him, Chikawa received guidance according to his experience in a continuous course of mind training that lasted six years. Through practicing it, he was able to rid himself completely of every trace of selfishness. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments? No, no questions, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so it's I I read a little bit um other readings like um uh, about the Geshe Chakawa, um you you can check him out. Uh, I have a little uh Kampo also talked about him his achievement later in this explanation, and uh, the reason um why uh this master. So he went to see this master and uh, the master didn't talk about this teaching, right? And the reason for that is that at that time, uh, the eight verses of training the mind was actually was a tantric teaching, was a secret teaching, and it was only taught to to the um the few that were prepared. Just like um just like when you want to teach the doctrine, the great perfection, you have to go through the preliminaries. So this is one of those secret teachings at that time. Um, and uh, in here, it says, uh, Chakawa stayed with Sharava for six years to do just this one practice, month training. Um, the of course, then what does that mean? Read himself completely of every trace of selflessness. Um, so my own interpretation is that um, like a, like a, actually it said uh, here, it is the one you can only dispense with if you don't want to attend Buddhahood. So um, 
this may suggest that he, by practicing this mind training, um, he has at least realized no self, right? Um, that's my understanding. Um, I guess we already learned uh, the merits of circumambulating a stupa. Um, I want to put a little more words in here. Let me see if I can get it right. There. Okay, here we go. Uh, by Padmasambhava, he says, all those who circumambulate the stupa will achieve the seven qualities of the higher realm. That is race, form, wealth, power, wisdom, no life, and low disease. And then by Namaishi, and he says, by circumambulating a holy stupa, you will achieve perfect power, perfect perseverance, no laziness, and will achieve realizations of the path to enlightenment very easily. So there are lots of merits associated associated with circumambulating this stupa. Um, when we have chances, we should uh, do that. Um, okay, that is that. I have another note somewhere. Oh, that's him. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, His Holiness Jimmy Pensurin, but you're talking about these three commentaries, right? the 37 practices of Bodhisattva uh, and the three principles at, principal aspects of the path by uh, Namazokapa and uh, and this one. So um, all these are very important texts. At least we can go take a look of uh, what they talk about. Me. Well, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, in the seven qualities, uh, I saw race, form, uh, wealth, and uh, what does it mean to have a race? Higher... Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this is uh, there's another word actually. It's probably more appropriate. It's called a caste. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, which means you are born in um, in groups or families that um are more prone to practice Buddhism or more accessible to Buddhism study. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Nah, yeah, not 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 like not the uh, white, <laughs> uh, black. No, <laughs> we, no. we all these all these translations can, could cause some <laughs> misinterpretation. <laughs> race is, I think, sometimes family probably even serves better because caste you easily uh, think of the Indian. Indian, uh, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Class, a little bit political. <laughs> I think yeah. family. Uh, there's there's another word when uh, maybe there, when there's a chance I can check and share later. But I think there's a word. For that uh -huh. Yeah, and also um, we always talk about the Mahayana caste, right? Or um, yeah, Mahayana caste. Um, and we also they are um, basic vehicle caste, like uh, people are more. Are interested in study the basic vehicle, and there are people more interested in study mm. Mahayana Buddhism. So these are called also races <laughs> in per se. <laughs> Some words from Akimbo uh, Sodagi. The eight verses for training the mind can bring tremendous benefits to the practice of both. Sutrayana teachings and uh, Tantrayana teachings. I give the teaching on this text on the request of uh, a few disciples, and I'm very grateful to them. The words of this text are simple, but their meaning is profound. I have added some 
scriptural evidences and stories so that you may get a better understanding. I wish I could talk more, but I regret to tell you that I myself have not practiced it so well and have had a, only a little understanding and relevant experience. Perhaps relying on that small amount of experience, I can share a bit more of this topic with you. I believe that this text will be of great help to the majority of the Dharma practitioners, both in their practices and, and as a way to help them to behave properly. Actually, only bodhisattvas abiding on the first level or above can fully perfect the practice of eight verses for training the mind. Nevertheless, uh, we can do similar practices with these pith instructions and with the blessing of the guru, work with it in our mind continuum as much as we can and gradually we will veer to such a status in our spiritual practice. The author of the text, Kandampa Agesha Langri Tampa, was one of the two main disciples of Bhagisha Patova, who was among the six senior disciples of Lord Atisha. Langri Tampa, Tampa once made an inspiration. May I benefit sentient beings in the appearance of uh, Bokshu in all my lifetimes. Then Paudan Lammo, glorious goddess, Adama practiced Protector, protector also made an inspiration. As the Langri Tampa made such a wish, I also promised to protect and support him to accomplish all his activities. Because of this, the lineage disciples of Langri Tampa all have Pauden Lamo as their Dharma Pala. Gesha Langri Tampa upheld the pure precepts during his whole life. After practicing in a secluded place for a long time, he began to accept disciples and imparted Dharma teachings to them. It is said that he had over 2,000 disciples as his retinue. He built the Longtang Monastery at the place called the Long tongue. So people named him Langri Tampa. He never smiled in his life except on one occasion when a mouse tried to move a piece of uh, turquoise on his uh, mandala plate. The mouse was trying desperately to push the turquoise but could not manage. So he called over another mouse to come and help him. And together they tried to move it. They, that made Langari Tampa smile, which was the only time that he smiled. He had a permanently gloomy expression, so people used to call him Lang, Lang Thapa Gloomy Face. One of his disciples asked him not to be so gloomy, and he replied, when I think about all the endless suffering in the samsara and there is no happiness in the three realms, how could I ever possibly smile? Patro Rinpoche once said, when you meditate on the suffering of samsara, you should meditate it at all times, like Langri Tampa, and thus arouse a genuine renunciation of samsara from the bottom of your heart. The detailed biography of Gesha Langri Tampa can be found in the Blue Annals. The title of the text, the eight, the eight verses for training the mind is not a complete commentary. According to the defined structure of Buddhist scriptures originated in India, a special feature of a text is to have a homage verse at the beginning and a dedication verse in the end. This feature is used to differentiate the Buddhist scriptures from non-Buddhist once the homage the homage verse can tell 
if the text that belongs to the Sutra Pitaka, Vin Vinyaya Pitaka, or Abhidhamma Pitaka, and what is the tradition and the deity of the author, etc. But this text has no homage verse nor dedication verse. Actually, it is a long zhong, mind training among Langri Tampa's faith instructions on Dharma practice. Long zhong means observing and training one's own mind and is the most important practice in Buddhism. This text was composed on the basis of the Bodhicitta fifth instructions of Lord Atisha and Geisha Potova. The eight verses in this text are eight key instructions of Mahayana practice. They took, they look independent, but are in a logic sequence and form a complete longjong system. For some beginners or those who don't really want to put them into practice, the eight verses might seem simple. For the genuine uh, Dharma practitioners, however, the practice of even one of these verses is of great benefit. One can even attain enlightenment by just practicing one or half of the verse in his or her life. Great. Any comments? Mm, so far, so good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I have a few slides to sh add a little more about uh, uh, Chakawa. And his other name is called Chakawa Yeshi Doji. Um, he was born... He was in the 12th century. Um, and of course, Kadamba master, because he followed uh, Potova, who was um, Atisha's, uh, what? Yeah, Potova and what the uh, uh, Lord Atisha's uh, disciple, right? So, <clears throat> but he also learned uh, from uh, Rachamba who was uh, Milarepa's uh, disciple. And he was born in a Nima tradition, in a family uh, practicing Nima school. Um, so after he got the teaching and practiced the teaching of eight verses of training the mind, um, he later actually developed, wrote his own text called um, mm, the seven points of training the mind, I believe. Let's see the next one. Compose the training the mind in seven points. Uh, this is also a very famous text. Um, we, I think we are senior, a little bit more senior students have all studied all these. Um, so he was, not nobody, and he was a very famous figure, and he was the one actually decided to, after he composed that seven point of mind training, um, he decided to make it um, like a, not a, no more a tantra practice, rather than a, like a more open public um, practice. Um, some some say he stayed with the Sharava where he got the teaching for twelve years until he was enlightened. Um, so and and uh, of course at that old times so practicing Dharma um, was not an easy thing and of course uh, went through all the hardships. Um, but. But apparently he was highly achieved. And uh, so his uh, text, Training the Mind in Seven Points, is also one of the essential root texts for uh, Kadamba tradition and was the basis for Tsongkhapa's text, Sun Rays of Training the Mind. So he had all this uh, great impact for the later masters. 
and what so played a very important role in um making this teaching more widely open um in practice. So and also uh in this little paragraph talking about his achievement and the uh, in in campus explanation and uh, then there was one leper right come up to him and told him that uh, um that master who composed uh, the Narutamba was uh, uh he passed away um when he was in NASA right and then uh at that time lepers were quite common in Tibet. And then he taught these people uh, how to train the mind, especially the teachings on Taunan. This is called Taunan and taking and giving. Um, the other term called uh, the, uh, the exchange of self and others. And by that practicing, many of those lepers actually um, healed themselves. So this, because lepers were not treatable uh, in the old times. So this actually gave um, people a lot of confidence, even including his brother, who was not a Buddhist in the beginning, even was against uh, Dharma. And then he started to practice as well. So his impact was pretty big and uh, in that time. And when he vowed to be um, reborn every lifetime as a bhikkhu, which means he will be ordained as a monk in each of his lifetime. And then this pardon Lamo, um, Dharma protector, uh, Dharma Pala is all the means Dharma protector, also vowed to protect his activities, uh, life after life. So, so making vows can make things happen. Uh, we also learned about uh, some some called um, he love a smile, right? And some called a gloomy, gloomy face or or no face. Um, no thumpa. Why the only thing that made the um, gloomy face? <laughs> What's his name? Uh, long. Langari, uh, Langari Tampa smile is that uh, two mice working together thing. Why that particular story become kind of so so significant? <laughs> Good question. What do you think? Um, It might be showing him the power of a um, of a sangha or like a unified effort or collaboration made him mm. have some hope in the in this samsara or you know uh, kind of like. Because he was uh, very serious or gloomy looking all the time <laughs> <laughs> for the reason of the suffering in samsara. And maybe this incidence is uh, kind of opposite to the suffering in some ways. And uh, give him some hope or joy um, seeing two mice work together. <laughs> I don't know. It was interesting because in the Chinese study, um, the student asked you the same question. Why only this event brought a smile to his face? Um, I think in my own study, my own thinking, um, not necessarily right. My understanding is that um, when he saw these mice do the work, 
you see the collaboration, you see the effort. And this is no difference than any human beings, right? So um, this is, in my opinion, this is a very good demonstration of Gata Gata Gaba, like all sentient beings have this Buddha nature. And uh, just they they display this Buddha nature um naturally. So I, I I don't know if this is right, but I don't I, this is what I think. And I, I want I like to see what uh, Oliver think. <laughs> Good question from oh, anyone anyway, ask any other people. Oh, this has been many years. I have not figured out either. So I think culturally maybe <laughs> it's culturally different so that something make you smile or not. Plus, you know, many things, if you see, you know, one version of explanation of how these two mice were doing, uh, there has to be many times that he has seen similar things. But of course, to me, this piece of stone, this tortoise to people is precious, but to mice is nothing. Right? They don't eat this. You can't eat a piece of stone. And then usually mice should work independently instead of co collectively in a group. Uh, it, it's quite different. And then and then this for something that they don't really need. They may thought it's a very good piece of cheese um, instead of stone. So again, <laughs> like Fon said, this is nothing different than us, right? We we strive, we uh, fight for things that don't really have any value. <laughs> uh, I guess this is probably the, j just that. And he saw, okay, not only human being, even mice can do this collective karma together. Um, anyways, at that moment, he might feel very funny. That's my, the best mm -hmm. I could figure it out. <laughs> could have figured it out. I like it. This is this this is he he looks like a scary level smile. <laughs> okay. Uh, Maybe Aita? for that, just add one added a couple of words. At that time when I was studying this this uh uh story, I didn't think about that. I th just thought, okay, this must be some kind of practitioner or like the type of teacher or uh, parents that never smile in front of you. Um, but I think anything these great achievers uh, do uh, or did must match the uh, purpose of, uh, of benefiting others or the you know beings around him. So if those around him are best benefited through a gloomy face, just don't smile, right? If some of them <laughs> are those uh, smiling face, like many of the Chinese, you just you best be those Buddha statue that smiles all the time. Uh, <laughs> some new thinking. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, there is a smiling, like a laughing Buddha, right? In in yeah, Chinese culture, like different manifestations, right? Verse one, always hold others as dear and precious. By thinking of all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel for accomplishing the highest aim, I will always hold them dear. Every genuine Dharma practitioner should hold fully to an aspiration like this. I will think of all sentient beings who inhabit the three realms and are wandering in samsara. They are more precious than the wish-fulfilling gem. For this reason, I am determined to work for the ultimate benefits and well-being of all sentient beings, who I will always hold as dear and precious. This I will do gladly. Why sentient beings are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel? The wish-fulfilling gem can only grant us temporary benefits, such as the treasures of property and money. It does not have the power to grant us the greatest benefit, which is ultimate nirvana. For this, we can look to the countless sentient beings who in themselves comprise a sublime field of merit. 
If we plant the seed of Bodhi in this fertile field, it will bring us bring to us a harvest of both temporary worldly happiness in the near term, as well as the eventual transcendent ultimate happiness. For instance, with respect to the paramita of generosity, which is one of the six paramitas, if there are if there were no sentient beings, there would be no focus for the practice of giving which would mean that there would be no way for us to carry out an act of generosity. As for the paramita of discipline, since disturbing emotions arise due to sentient beings, there would be no way for vowed discipline to be conducted to counteract disturbing emotions if there were no human beings involved. Furthermore, in the case of the paramita of patience, as Shanti Devas has said, transcendent patience does not come to be when harm is absent. If there were no sentient beings feeling resentment, there would be no patience that could be practiced, nor would there be the merit of patience. The list goes on. The paramitas of diligence, concentration, and wisdom can only be completed by relying on sentient beings. If there were no sentient beings, there would be no perfecting of the six paramitas and the 10,000 performances of a bodhisattva. And so the attaining of unsurpassed Buddhahood would merely be a dream too far away to be reached. We should therefore work to fulfill both the temporary aspirations and ultimate aspirations of sentient beings through our spiritual practice, which include holding a caring and cherishing mind towards sentient beings in every minute, in every second of everyday life. Practitioners with such qualities can be considered to have a true mind of loving kindness and great compassion. Such a mind is the true manifestation of the spirit of Mahayana, known as Bodhicitta. The usual pitfall of ordinary Dharma practitioners. The great Kadampa masters of the past, like Geshe, Langri, Thangpa, all had a noble morality and virtuous personality. These are things that the Mahayana practitioners of today should endeavor to learn. Otherwise, the aspiration to become a bodhisattva or a Buddha will only remain as empty words. It is a great pity that in today's society, most people, regardless of whether they are Buddhists or not, lack a noble personality, not to mention have a Mahayana bodhicitta mind. Even among dedicated Buddhist practitioners, there are those who have shown extremely incorrect attitudes towards sentient beings, while on the other hand, they may often treat sentient beings with anger and aversion, or may even act as if sentient beings were their enemies. At the same time, on the other hand, they may harbor in their mind reverence and respect for the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Shantideva, in his The Way of the Bodhisattva, questioned this behavior by asking, what kind of practice is it, then, that honors only Buddhas but not sentient beings? Instructions like, you should only respect Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but not sentient beings, can never be found in any of the Buddhist teachings. Shantideva criticized this incorrect behavior by asking this question. If one is unable to manage such a great deed as fulfilling the aspirations of sentient beings and always holding them to be dear and precious, even though he may seek the Dharma everywhere, his practice will definitely not be rewarded with success. There is a story that illustrates this in the sutra. Once upon a time, there was a father and a son who were in a possession of a wish-fulfilling gem. One day, while they were on a journey, the father became tired and wanted to take a short nap. Before laying down, he said to his son, take good care of the wish-granting gem, and during my nap, be sure not to give it to anyone. Soon after, the father closed his eyes and fell asleep. A short while later, a band of thieves came walking up the road. Seeing the child sitting there holding the wish-fulfilling gem, they demanded that he give it to them. The child replied, I cannot give it to you because just before my father fell asleep, he told me not to give the wish-fulfilling gem to anyone. One of the thieves reached into his pocket and pulled out a bag of candy and held one of the sweet morsels out to the boy. The shiny stone that you are holding is useless to you, but these candies are sweet and you can eat as many as you like right now. Come on, let's make a trade. The child looked longingly, longingly at the bag of candy in the thief's hand, and after only a moment of hesitation, handed over the wish-fulfilling gem in exchange for the bag of candy. 
When the father woke up and heard that the son had traded the wish-fulfilling gem of all, of all the magical properties for a simple bag of candy, he was very upset and disappointed. Dharma practice is the same. Once you have abandoned its essential principle, even if you receive some minor sense of happiness, you will never realize its greatest benefits. For example, if you judge one sentient being as inferior and another as unattractive, if you feel anger or resentment towards them, then you have abandoned the bodhicitta mind, and your so-called spiritual practice will bring very little, if any, true merit. When we read the biographies of great spiritual masters in India, the Tibetan region, or the Han region, either in the past or the present, we find that their minds and behavior, we find that their minds and behavior without exception, explicitly display the kind of great compassion that cherishes all sentient beings and seeks to fulfill all of their aspirations. So here we can see that this verse talks about, so here we can see that what this verse talks about is the ultimate and the most sublime fifth instruction in Mahayana practice, that of benefiting sentient beings. Okay, great. Thank you. Any any comments or thoughts in this verse? Um, I like this verse because it's, although it seems so simple and it's easy to understand intellectually, it's extremely hard to put it into practice consistently. Um, But it's interesting to realize that sentient beings bring, like all sentient beings, beings bring Buddhahood closer to us by providing us with uh, the opportunity to accumulate merit, to practice patience, um, to practice the six paramitas. Um, and it's not easy. It's hard to be faced with um afflictions and resentment and have troublesome interactions with other people but they're important because that's how we're able to put our practice into actual practice um so it's like a good reminder to not those aren't the times to like hide away and abandon your practice it's like where we actually practice um I hope to get to a place where I can easily have that mindset and see all every experience with every sentient being, no matter how scary or harsh or harmful it is, but to allow um, fear and harm to be my teacher and to you always use it as a moment or an opportunity to practice. Very well said. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. It's very simple verse, but it's uh, it's not that really not that easy to put into practice. Um, especially when we look at people who don't really behave right, and uh, or people who I, you know, um, addicted to alcohol, uh, substances like those substance abuse all these people um a lot of people they i i like people with uh, love countries can have compassion towards them but in general a lot of other people may just like think why are these people doing this and uh, that is disgusting it's very easy to have that kind of feelings but for buddhism practitioners when you hold this kind of feelings, that that is actually a very serious issue, as pointed out by Kambu here. This is um, this is actually abandoning the um, uh, what he said. This is actually abandoning the bodhicitta mind. So, if you abandon the bodhicitta mind, then you're no longer really a Mahayana practitioner. And all your practice will, like, uh, be kind of basically futile. 
So, um, so can we here also talking about uh, the usual pitfall of ordinary practitioners? Um, so people often um, forget about the um, bodhicitta mind and uh, they, they practice because maybe meditation makes them feel good uh, or doing some um, charity activities make them feel good like uh, at this kind of level instead of like um, that, that bodhicitta mind um, benefiting sentient beings and place them in the Buddhahood. Um, so that kind of uh, aspiration is really requires um, some training, I would say. Um, so this is a very um, important issue. And also, Kambuhiya talks about it in the first sub point, and he talks about without the sentient beings, why the sentient beings are more precious than which for falling jewel. Um, actually, I just learned from um <laughs> the other teaching, the wish for falling gem, like uh, to us uh, nowadays, sounds like um legendary or some like um something unreal, right? Uh, we cannot imagine there are such things that when we demand for something, it just can uh, manifest it in just give it to us. Uh, but according to uh, Nonchenpa and some uh, great masters, um, in certain um, times of the, of the um, I would say, uh, Buddhism cosmic times, when the humans were having more merits um, than nowadays humans, Nowadays, humans, uh, comparing to like ancient times, I'm not talking about historically. This historically, uh, the the histo history with records that we can see, but with more profound like back kind of history, according to Buddhism, um, when humans were like uh, can live up to eighty thousand years old, um, they make look better they may have more happiness and then the because of the um merits and uh, they may have those uh, wish for falling gem and or wish for falling trees appeal to them and then whatever they want they they can just like simply get it from those things but these things just can satisfy people's daily daily life cannot really um, give uh, them the power of liberation. Um, just like, um, but sentient beings can, because when we make our aspirations um, based on this, um, benefiting all the sentient beings, then they will be more precious really than the wish for falling jewel. This is what that means here. Um, all right, that's all I have to say. Anyone else have anything else to say, to comment? I think to have a Buddhist of mind, you need to have unconditional love, compassion, and empathy. And I think unconditional love is just that. You know? um, so when we are challenged by individuals or situations that um, make us judge or uh, make us look at these people in a negative way, we should consider those situations or those people as our teachers. We should be grateful for those situations to le mm -hmm. learn from it and... Uh, to uh, aspire to be more of a bodhisattva or a bodhicitta-minded person 
right? So we should be grateful for those situations rather than resent them or harbor any ill feelings towards them. Yeah. And that's what I mean. Very good, very good. Just remember these words. By thinking of all sentient beings as more precious than a wish for falling jewel, for accomplishing the highest aim, I will always hold them dear. The highest aim. What do you, what is your understanding of highest aim? Accomplishing the highest aim. Um, I think accomplishing the highest aim would be just that, uh, accomplishing um, a, a Mahayana Buddhist way of thinking. Uh, that's how I interpret that. Uh, and uh, I think one of one of the things were pointed out is um, to regard everything else at a higher regard than yourself. Right? That's that's one thing that we should aspire to do on a regular basis. Mm. And, uh, you know, not to say that you are low, lower than anybody else, but um, we have to, like it says, uh, um, every sentient being is more precious, not only than a wishing fulfilling jewel, but more precious than yourself. I think we should have high regard for everything and anyone, every sentient being. Very good. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what that's what it's meant to me. Accomplishing the highest highest aim, the highest aim would be accomplishing uh, uh, mindfulness and and um, a. Uh, uh, bodhicitta way of thinking mm, okay can be a little higher because uh, okay uh, I'm going... <laughs> <You> <laughs> yeah very good there we go okay but then again uh why do you want to attend buddhahood to uh to stop uh, recycling in the three realms when you pass, to, to stop the cycle of society. For subside. yourself? No, for all, <laughs> for all sentient beings. Very well. That, okay. There you go. Yeah. So for attending, sometimes this is, took me for a while uh, to, to, to learn that, so we, we always say we want to attend the Buddhahood, right? But then why do we want to attend the Buddhahood? Um, um, because only when only after we attend the Buddhahood or attend the um the Bodhisattva ways, then we can better benefit all sentient beings. Because right now as ordinary beings, we really have very limited power and a limited capacity. But once you're united and uh, once you attend the Buddhahood, your capacity and your power is limitless. Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And one thing I would suggest is like um um try to recite these verses. It's a short verse, short text. If we can recite it and remind ourselves all the time, it will be a great thing. Um, so it's it's easy to 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 forget. I mean, um, uh, but if we can recite it, and uh, we can always remind ourselves. Verse two: Consider myself as the lowest among all. Whenever I'm in the company of others. I will regard myself as the lowest among all, and from the depths of my heart, cherish others as the supreme. Where, wherever I'm, uh, I am and uh, whomever I interact with, I will view myself as the lowest of all and humble myself before them. From the depths of my heart, I will think uh, constantly of benefiting others. By constantly holding others as uh, superior to me and treating them with uh, reverence and uh, respect, I will tame my pride 
and the arrogance and hold others above me. The perfect example of Buddhas and the Buddhist Havas in Lama uh, Song Kappa, so a commentary on 50 words of Guru devotion. There is such a line in the homage verse that says, constantly reciting above all, but also as a servant to sentient beings. This is uh, meant as a priest of all from Mandrashri. Also, he is the teacher of all Buddhas and is supreme among all sentient beings. Mandrashri still attends to all sentient beings like a servant. And this is also the conduct of all the Buddhas, Buddhas, uh, Buddhas Sattvas and the great uh, spiritual masters who also feel this uh, transcendence, uh, transcendence merit and uh, virtues, still serve the world as a servant. Just as the uh, venerable Long Chen Pa said in his uh, finding of uh, comfort and ease in the nature of mind and the great perfection, the Guru's enlightenment is far beyond of uh, the secular beings. In spite of this, he still attends to the world and carried out uh, compassionate activities for the benefit of uh, sentient beings. As Dharma practitioners, we need to follow this uh, marvelous uh, example. Observe our mind and tame arrogance. Uh, this verse mainly teaches us that the need of uh, observe of mind and to make sure that it is will not give in, give in to feelings of uh, arrogance or pride towards any other such beings. There is a Tibetan uh, adage that goes like this. The peak of arrogance can't hold the spring water of merit. Therefore, all people, even those who are always full of sublime merit, must be free of arrogance or pride and constantly hold in their mind the aspiration to respect and benefit others. Only when we think of benefiting others single-mindedly, uh, single-minded, uh, mindedly, are we? Uh, it's very good. Huh? Uh, are we able to regard sentient beings as wish fulfilling gems and uh, revere them as supreme treasures in the way that we do towards Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and our supremely kind gurus? For instance, Bodhisattva uh, uh, KC was. Uh, Great of all is, if hells are not completely empty of separate beings, I vow never to attend Buddhahood. And uh, furthermore, only when every last session being has uh, converted as a uh, thief, shall I achieve the Buddha? If Bodhisattva uh, has not seen such beings as uh, superior and uh, noble than himself. He would never have made such a great vow. If he had uh, himself high above the others and acted like an emperor, how could he realize the perfect uh, accomplishment of such a deep uh, aspiration and in our everyday conduct and in our interactions with others? We need to, on the one hand, generate a great bodhisattva towards sentient beings, and on the other hand, to see ourselves as the lowest among all, and to truly think of benefiting others from the depths of our heart. Lord Atisha, throughout his life, gave three great pitch instructions for training the mind. First, examine the mind constantly. Second, 
tame the mind with the mindfulness and the alertness. Third, by constantly doing so, generate the bodhisattva in the mind stream. If it is uh, also recounted in the Pongjing Zamba, the 37 practitions of Bodhisattva, that in short, whenever I am, whatever I do, to be continuously mindful and uh, alert, asking, what is the state of my mind? And accomplishing the good of others is the practice of a Bodhisattva. From this, we can see the intention of Lord Atisha and uh, Tommy Zamba is exactly the same. Thank you. Um, I know you might have something to say. Uh, yeah, I think mm, this is uh, a very good uh, verse. And because it's uh, very clearly uh, instruct you, consider myself as the lowest uh, among all. Uh, because if you always remind this, you will uh, uh, drive out your pride because the uh, pride and the Judith, because the pride and Judith, uh, special for the pride, actually is far more selfish. So if you, because if you, without uh, remand, the people, they will have, if you have the chance, they will be pride. So, uh, so if you remind the, yourself always it, it it's alert i think of the alert very very good because you always observe yourself and give you alert this uh, this thinking is uh, not to follow buddha so so this alert very very nice uh, ways uh, to to remind yourself and uh, also this very clear instructions uh, tell you don't uh, arise your pride. So that's all. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and pride and arrogance is. Uh, it's, I think the, the 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 crude one is easy to realize, but actually the um the subtle ones is really difficult uh to even realize so um so can we explain it in in two three two um in two ways when well, number the first way is to use uh buddhas and bodhisattvas as examples um being humble or place oneself in the low place does not mean um, like uh, we place ourselves in, I mean, does not mean that we don't need to train ourselves to be noble. Um, we do need to do that, but uh, in the same time, we can still be the servant to all the sentient beings, um, even including Bodhisattva Manjushri, right? Like in Tsongkhapa's um, prostration, uh, homage verse. So, um, and uh, so similarly, Nongchenpa also used the guru as the example. The guru always, I this time I heard a story from um, Danzen Ktuku uh, in the Naronga. And when when people he was very well respected. He he was a tuku and uh, of course very like every every day he see he saw he like um we like uh, saw um people goes to his little yard and uh, receive his blessing. And then when one person from his hometown came to him and uh, asked him to, you know, 
want to borrow some money from him. And the Tuku told him, I don't want to borrow money, lend you the money. I'll just give you the money. So um, so this these are the like musters, what they do when people have needs. So whatever people need something, you know, just give to them without any oblig obligations. Um so th this is in a way I you know my understanding is also just like a be serving the uh sentient beings, right? So this is the examples of Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and uh, the gurus. Of course, gurus is no difference than the Bodhisattvas and uh, the Buddhas. And then the second point is that um, we need to observe our mind and attain our uh, arrogance. Um, so I am I like the Lord Atisha's three points. Like uh, first, examine the mind constantly. So I can tame the mind with mindfulness and alertness. Um, third, by constantly doing so, generate bodhicitta in the mind stream. I like to hear what Oliver says about this because this talks about mindfulness and examine the mind. Oliver. Yeah, allow me. Just distract a little bit. Lord Atisha? Yeah, how about you? Examine the mind constantly, second, tame the mind with mindfulness and awareness. Third, well, what is your trick doing this actually in your daily practice? Mm, I think in our own uh, tradition, uh, I guess maybe not too much from the mindfulness practice, but uh, again, I still feel our practice makes more sense. Just keep <laughs> keep checking our own mind. Um, there is actually, um, this is not Buddhism, but traditional uh, Chinese teaching like Confucius uh, is actually an idiom. An idiom, not necessarily Confucius, but anything happens. And then um, you go check the root should be to check yourself, anything about yourself. Of course, in a Buddhism context, it will be our mind. Uh, I think if really, if there's anything, Alan, uh, anything, any challenges uh, that we encounter, it always come, it, it, we can always trace it down to, to our own mind. Okay, I was thinking this, I was expecting this, because I was expecting this, and it didn't happen my way, and then I got disappointed. So I generated all these um, um, uh, resentment, uh, hatred. So um, it more also more like in the example of video or film is a slow motion. So because our mind just jumping here and there, uh, calculating very quickly more than the Nvidia chips. <laughs> And um, but if we can check our mind with this mindfulness, you you play that slow motion, then you find that lots of things are happening, and then lots of things are happening. Uh, just the moment you're able to see it, it pretty much solved more than 50 50 percent of the of the problem. So, yeah, that's 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 how I feel with uh, with some time. Um, with some time, the skill can also increase, right? You just quickly check it. And that, for example, if you want to, if you would like to uh, calm down when, when someone, um, you know, uh, you know, annoyed you and you try to calm down without these kind of trainings, it could take days, hours, right? Minutes. But as you are more and more, um, you know, the skill, you're more and more um, familiar with those kind of skill. Um, it, it could just happen with a, uh, what, flashing <laughs> seconds or pretty much with, with not too much uh, notice, right? With not too much uh, like vibrations, wavy moments. That makes sense? Makes sense to me. 
Yeah. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> so. so for examining the mind, my own experience was like um when when we respond to people, right? So so normally we we respond out of like um no consciousness, just like when people I am happy with you, you may just spontaneously respond with resentment or unhappiness, right? In whatever just moment of the emotion come up. But if you if you ask yourself right away, so um so when you like when you want to respond with some words, if you can like just take a moment to think about why do I want to respond in this way? Um, you don't really need to go analyze why other people are doing this in that way. They have their own reasons. You don't, all you need to do is examine your own mind. You don't want to examine other people's mind because that is kind of a, not actually um, less useful. Um, Examine your own mind is actually much more useful. If you say something just because you feel yourself, I write, or you feel yourself, I like super real or no better or you know all those things. Um, be sure that is your self ego is functioning. Um, then. Then in my own experience, when I examined that way, I could at least uh, communicate with people in a more reasonable way. So just like uh, put away a little bit of uh, self in the conversation. Um, just focus. Sometimes you can just focus on the facts or sometimes you can try to understand and uh, all those things really improve communication and improve relationship. So, and then of course, this these three points go step by step, like uh, um, uh, escalating, right? So when you go to the third points, by do so generate the bodhicitta in the mind stream, um, by constantly um, thinking yourself with, Probably you're not right, or you are in the, uh, like what the words say, um, regard yourself, myself as the lowest among all. Uh, if we can really <laughs> do that, this is not easy to do. I find it's not easy to do for me. I'm the lowest of all. No, I am not. <laughs> so, but um, you, you put it into practice really solves a lot of problem. Um, when especially when other parties are angry, um, actually I did encounter. I have to I have to let my postdoc uh, leave because my funding is out, and also I didn't think she performed well enough, and she was quite angry towards me because I had let him let her go. So she threw a lot of words to me and then I let her wrote like five, six emails and then I responded one and said, look, um, I wish you success and I appreciate you staying with me for this past one year and uh, eight months. So uh, just be advised that uh, I will be happy to help you for your career development if you need me. Then just by that, and she stopped saying anything further. Um, So um I I do feel I do feel she could manage her angle a little better because she's living, she's for sure she's living, but she still wants to throw out all those uh, resentment to me that really doesn't help her at all. Um because her future work, her future job, she still needs my recommendation. Um, I some so for that I really feel bad for her. Um, but anyhow, 
I guess we can stop at this verse over here. Well, time is about up. Any any other thoughts? People, um, anyone wants to share? Um, I mean, I can share from my personal experience just regarding the last verse that we just read. Okay. Um, for my personal experience so far, I'm trying to really practice examining the mind um, more constantly and not just when I'm meditating, but actually examining it throughout the entire day when I'm like actually out experiencing everyday life and engaging with people. Um, and I find that I, it's, it's much harder. It's so much easier when you're alone or in meditation to examine the mind, but it's very difficult to keep it constant throughout the day. But I've been practicing trying to examine my mind and catch those moments of pride and arrogance that are so subtle because it's almost sometimes I realize it's already like built into my thinking or what is considered normal thinking. And I, I'm starting to notice that like, Sometimes I, I'll think I'm being truly loving and compassionate, but I realize I'm only doing it towards the people that are compassionate to me. Um, I'm not really doing it equally or completely selflessly um, or noticing when I'm almost subconsciously choosing who has earned my compassion or who deserves my compassion. So it's, um that's something that I've noticed in myself it doesn't happen all the time but sometimes it's so subtle but I'm starting to catch those little moments wow that's a very I that's very good comments um so that really uh says how deeply you're mindful uh to me <laughs> I think it's great I think that involves um, intention and motiv motivation, you know, uh, or intention is the biggest one. What what was your intention when you were being not necessarily mindful, but when you, you were being uh, uh, loving to to those people? You know, were you were you intending on getting that back? I think uh, motivation and intention has a lot to do with. Or you uh, act towards other people personally. <laughs> All right. Um, so, can you do the dedication? Read the dedication for us then? Sure. <clears throat> Just as all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas dedicated merit, so likewise, I also dedicate all merit to the cause of enlightenment of all sentient beings. By this accumulation of merit, may I obtain all seeing omniscience and may all faults be defeated. The whirling turbulent waves of birth, aging, sickness, and death from the ocean of samsara, may I liberate beings. Just as the Bodhisattva Manjushri attained omniscience and Samantambhadra too, all these merits now I dedicate to train and follow in their footsteps. As all the victorious Buddhas of past, present and future, praise dedication as supreme. So now I dedicate all these roots of virtue for all beings to perfect good actions. O Aham Bhajra Guru Padra Siddhi Om. O Aham Bhajra Guru Padra Siddhi Om. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.